little oh yeah okay so so today is um, uh, December 4th 2018 and this is a review session for the final exam in ECE 3030 semiconductor device physics or whatever the then the official title name is but that's basically as you know it's semiconductor uh, device physics um, so it, before we started, uh, we were in agreement that what I will do with the time uh, allowed, it didn't make really sense for me to repeat going over the PDFs from the first midterm and the PDFs of the second midterm, because we already did that in previous review sessions, and we recorded it, and I posted it on YouTube. So you have the liberty of that. So what I'll do with the time uh, allowed is I'm going to uh, focus on the three terminal devices, which is the new testable material. I will go through that PDF and, and in the same fashions that I've done before. Then I'll open up for question and answers. But your question and answers can go from everything A to Z uh, in the domain space of 3030. And um, uh, so uh, let's do that. Okay, so I should have somewhere here. Um, Where did I put it? Uh, no, I guess I didn't download it yet. There it is. Download. Okay. Oh, I already did that. Okay. Okay, so, um, uh, by the way, uh, pardon my appearance, I came from the gym, I, uh, I'm a big proponent of, uh, of strong mind, strong body, and uh, because of this, I can't go to the gym when in my normal time, so I went before, so I just came in from, from that. Um, so, anyway, uh, let's get started. Three terminal devices. Okay, so a FET is a voltage-controlled current source, and... Uh, Tomorrow's lecture, your last lecture, will be on bipolar junction transistors, which is a current controlled current source. And that will also be testable, I want to forewarn you. So do not miss tomorrow's class, okay? Um, uh, or, uh, or you'll probably lose at least one question on the final exam, okay? Um, so what is an FET? It's, it's this gate that is, that is uh, modulating the current going through the source and drain. So that's what we need to keep our eye on uh, in, in looking at this and how this starts to impact as we shrink it and shrink it. And that's kind of the later stages. So we're looking at what defines its, uh, its, its uh, parameters, uh, such as threshold voltage, when does it turn on, when does it turn off, and how we can manipulate all of that and so forth. And a lot of the other stuff is extra win, uh, uh, icing on the cake, and we just need to look uh, at the fundamentals. And you know that's the way I try to emphasize in my class. Um, so again, I've borrowed, uh, as you've seen before, I borrow slides from all around uh, the net and, 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 and different books and so forth. And so here we have the circuit symbol you know, for the FET and the normal family of curves. And here you can see the spacings between the family of curves fairly equally spaced there. So um, hopefully you can make some uh, uh, understanding from that. Uh, this, is, this is a more scaled FET. I told you I was going to see in lecture, I was going to see Shuji, and I did see him. I was with him on Saturday and Sunday uh, and, uh, uh, in San Francisco. And here is showing a scaled FET. And now as we got towards the end of the lectures on FETs, now you start to see this slope, which we'll come to later, but now you see some of this evidence of why this is sloping here. Does anybody remember, if we kind of jump ahead in the syllabus a little bit, why was it, why was it uh, sloping like that? It was the channel width modulation. So as you, as you go into uh, the short channel effects, the uh, channel's length is, is being modulated and it's getting narrower and narrower. 
And so therefore, actually, as you go higher VDS, it's actually creeping up. And I didn't get a chance to really bring this home uh, in the lecture, but from a historical record point of view, these should actually, these, as, these tangents should actually converge to a singularity point, and that is referred to as the early effect uh, and the early voltage uh, where, they, uh, where they unite. And James Early is a distinguished Ohio State alum. Okay, uh, and so uh, yet another uh, Ohio State alum that has impacted the field of semiconductor device physics. Um, so, and speaking of which, this is Robert Chow's uh, team's work on the strain silicon, and here you can see uh, how we're ma they're manipulating the channel. And so, why was this? Um, why are they doing this? Does anybody remember? Good testable exam, uh, you know, question, right? Because this is this is generated by who? This is Robert Chow's team, another distinguished OSU alum, right? Uh, and so, what are, what's the achievement here? What are they trying to do when they put this SIGI in the source and drains? And clearly, they're doing compression, right? It says compression. Right? You know what's happening. So, why why is the compression making that better? Lizzie? Not sure. Huh? It's not sure. Okay. Anybody? It goes back to the, uh, uh, the fact that the valence band was normally degenerate. We had a uh, heavy hole and we had a light hole, right, in the valence band. And so as we go through compression, we're changing the band, band uh, structure such that the light hole actually starts to move up. And so then the holes will predominantly congregate in the light hole. And so the light hole has, what is the comparison of the effective mass of the light hole to the heavy hole, Stefan? The heavy hole is heavier. Yes, very thoughtful uh, response. Thank you, Stefan. So therefore, the light hole becomes lighter. So therefore, the uh, mobility and, and so forth transport goes up. So therefore, this will be a better device, right? And similarly, uh, in the end MOSFET under tension, you're torquing the bands in such a way that also that also contorts and changes the band structure that the effective mass for electrons up in the conduction band is being minimized. It's okay. So you can't forget your semiconductor. In fact, this course really isn't semiconductor devices. It's semiconductor materials and devices. And you have to be able to manipulate the materials to make the good devices. Okay. Now we've started to see on, on things impacting gates and so forth, how uh, this channel is being influenced by this gate through this intermediary, very, very thin oxide. And again, you can see how you can count how many atoms this is. This is, this is uh, 40 angstroms or four nanometers. And, uh, and these little fuzzy white balls, which are more prominent when you amplify it uh, here in this inset, and you can count how many uh, at ato equivalent atomic layers that oxide is. But remember, um, the gate is essentially just a vo uh, uh, electrostatically changing the transport of carriers in the channel just below this insulator interface. And that's really, this is the heart of the device, okay? <clears throat> so you, you can obviously see uh, opportunities uh, deleterious uh, 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 pathways where as we scale this even further, this is you know, going to become quantum mechanically thin and we get tunneling and leakage and problems there and so forth. And so here's, you, you now started to see uh, in my later lectures, we'll come back to this, uh, but you know, the scaling of, of SiO2 to this 1.2 nanometer starts to become untenable and it really falls apart at 0.8 nanometers as you continue to scale, so then it really becomes a no-go. Uh, and again, here's this, uh, I pilfered this from Robert Chow up at Intel. Um, and, uh, and so 
These are the driving forces from the ITRS roadmap. You've got the uh, thickness of that oxide, you have the permittivity of that uh, ma uh, material, and you have the gate length, uh, and the gate length triggers the reduction in the, uh, in the drive voltage uh, necessary, and that's going to reduce your power consumption. And as you uh, torque this, you're also going to, as you change the C ox, uh, this is related to the capacitance, you're also going to increase the speed, right? So this is the uh, uh, voltage uh, controlled uh, current source, and you have a differential resistance as we walk on over this. Um, and so therefore the load line analysis and, and, and such, and so, as we go through the family of curves, you're either starting at a higher resistance because of the gate bias changing the, uh, the channel parameters. And so we could be starting off of this and then we hit the saturation. And uh, so the FETs fall into uh, quite a, a family of <coughs> quite a large family of different transistors, but they all share the same uh, uh, features. They're uh, control output current with voltage, and they're majority carrier device, okay? So the entire family, you either have JFETs, where the gate is de delineated by a PN junction, or a MESFET, where the gate is de delineated by a Schottky barrier, or a MISFET, uh, where the uh, where the gate is on top of, a, of, a, of, a, of an insulator and a MOSFET where the gate is on top of an oxide and you could argue that an oxide is a subset of an insulator because there are insula uh, uh, um, uh, these oxides are, are kind of a subset. You have many more insulators that could be used uh, that don't, it doesn't need to be an oxide. So in a FET, it's a majority carrier device, right, emitted by the source and collected by the drain. And the output current is modulated by the third terminal called the gate. So the gate controls the current flow through that channel by either modulating the resistivity. And this is the one we kind of emphasize a little less because that's really the more of that JFET that I said we kind of uh, discounted. Or it's the number of carriers present. That's really how the mod FET works. That's how the MOSFET works. Uh, many, of these, uh, many of these advanced transistors are really modulating the carriers present in the channel. Uh, and the gate voltage controls the impedance of the channel from either con uh, conductive to non-conductive or vice versa. And so the MOSFET um, is a nice uh, uh, example of, of heterostructures and how you can, you can uh, make a very nice FET uh, where you're confining the charge into the channel and you're reducing the scattering, right? Remember the, that story. So you could end up high mobility. And it, a MOTFET can also be called a hemped. Uh, it just depends which camp you want to subscribe to. So the analogy is like a pipe which allows water to flow and has a gate uh, valve that uh, comes down and shuts off the water. I don't know if any of you worked with plumbing. Well, in our lab, we often work with vacuum system, which is basically plumbing. You're just, instead of plumbing water or so forth, you're plumbing uh, uh, gas uh, or so forth that you're, that you're trying to evacuate. So here's the JFET, which I, for the time's sake of the class, I uh, jumped over a bit. And, and, uh, and I always found it a little duplicitous to present the JFETs. And then at the end, you say, okay, forget about all that. We don't use that anymore, but uh, the equations still hold. And uh, so I just kind of feel like it's, one, a little waste of time, and we need to refresh. Uh, and the book, none of the, the introductory level textbooks have, have really broached the subject of going beyond the JFET kind of mm -hmm. model. Um, and so, you know, the idea was to introduce why does it roll over? Why does the family of curves roll over? And you start to see that differential resistance where as you apply uh, voltage to, uh, to the gate, which is a P plus junction uh, here, um, uh, then that depletion region will encroach upon the channel. And so it's just like that garden hose where you're pinching it and the charge coming from the source to the drain is inhibited going through here. So here we have 
uh, uh, a symmetric gate, which, uh, which is not really what we do. Um, so the pinch off and saturation, you know, here's where that differential resistance, so here's at low VDS, you end up with a large current flow. And so the differential resistance is, is, is uh, very low, so the t slope is very high. But then as you apply a gate and uh, the one side starts to encroach, the resistance goes up, so the differential resistance is, is, little, is walking over. And then eventually uh, the two uh, depletion regions touch and you end up into the uh, saturation. And, it, and it, uh, so the resistance is now uh, fairly uh, infinite. And so the differential resistance, so therefore it does not increase anymore. And this is again, uh, I tried to stay in the lectures, this is where the analogy of a garden hose sort of breaks down because you would think that when this collapses there would be no current and would be down here, but what I'm arguing is it's really the differential resistance, so there's no additional current that takes place. And so it rolls over. And as you modulate the gate, uh, your starting point can be moved up and down here, right? Um, so here's here's then the the um, the family of curves where you have the gate, and so it's it's cons considered to be in saturation once you pass this pinch off point, this locus of points here, and um, and and uh, everything's well behaved. But that's a, maybe about all I want to say on JFETs. Um, what I kind of like is the um, ballist, you know, this this uh, ballistic model uh, that we get, uh, or you know, bare barrier model uh, pr uh, from uh, Professor Mark Lundstrom at Purdue, where we're looking at that uh, that uh, the IV characteristics here, and so this is fairly similar, um, and. And remember, as you, uh, as you go to higher voltages and you go to smaller length scales, your, your, uh, the, the voltage, the volts per centimeter, starts going up and up and up. And so then you're in this velocity saturation regime where this is going to be beyond this velocity, velocity saturation. And remember, that's the, that's the sort of the Felix Baumgartner sort of analogy that I gave where it's not friction. I think some people said that in the uh, in, uh, previous midterm uh, answers. It's the scattering off the lattice. So as you're accelerating, you're going through the crystal lattice and you're, you're going to bump into things, right? It's, it's just, it's, you're not going through vacuum. You're not going through space. So you're going to hit things. It is like friction. Um, but it's really with the, I guess the terminology we, we use is scattering. And so that sort of puts a, a um, speed limit, if you will. Um, here you can see this is a little more uh, scale. Oh, this is the same one, I think, from Suji. Um, but the barrier model is really, if you want to carry and kind of remember something of advanced transistors going after this class, and I hope you, I hope you leave this class with some sort of a takeaway of advanced, uh, uh, this advanced technology, where it's going. Whether you go into semiconductor device, uh, uh, devices or not, um, knowing what are the uh, impediments and, and how we're solving that would, would uh, help hopefully arm you in your other, your other disciplines. And so here's with the barrier model, and you simply have, as you do a, a slice cutaway here, uh, you simply have a, a barrier where under the gate, um, this is going to inhibit the ability of carriers to move from the source to the drain. So the source is highly doped. So here you can see that the Fermi level is, is, is above the, uh, the, the conduction band here. So you can see that this is really an, uh, an ocean of electrons, as I like to sometimes say, and the drain is also an ocean of electrons. But underneath the gate, that's going to be your P material, so therefore it's depleted. So the Fermi level, and it's not showing it, but there should be a valence band that should be following this contour, right? So this Fermi level is going to be very near a valence band that's probably going to come up here. And so this is the P-type material. But as I apply a gate bias, then I'm going to be able to push this down, lower the barrier, and now the carriers flow through. And then it's like going to Vegas uh, and, and getting three cherries on your slot machine, right? So 
Here, as I I'll reduce the barrier, uh, the carriers can then march and come on through. And, um, and then if I want to really run the transistor in its full operation, I'm going to apply a VDS voltage as well. And therefore, I'm having these two orthogonal, remember I have a, a, a vo an electrostatic field going in the, C, in the Y direction from the gate, but I also have an electrostatic uh, interaction from the uh, source of the drain uh, going in the X direction. So now here, you put it all together, these two fields, you have the barrier coming down through the drain, uh, so source drain voltage, and also you have the barrier being lowered by the application of the gate. And so now that can allow the carriers to come on. And once you have that kind of a model, then things seem to make a little more sense. Here, uh, this, this uh, shows the operation here, where it's really more like a resistor, right? The differential resistance are being, being modulated here as it's coming in, um, in the low voltages. But then over here, it's not being limited so much. Now, once the carriers fall over this barrier, they're going to be collected by the, the electrostatics here. Uh, and so therefore, they're fairly calm. Once they, once they make it over the barrier, then you can see that they just continue unimpeded, right? So I'm not, I'm not necessarily creating more carriers, right? One electron across, and then it's just go, it's going to be swept by the electric field and continue. So that's why there's no additional current here. So now maybe this barrier model is a little more representative of the physical mechanisms inside, and so then you can see. So barrier control transports are responsible for the shape, and, um, and then you can see a uh, specific transport model determines the magnitude as you go through the, the C ox and the velocity saturation. Right? So here's linear steps and gate as you go through. And threshold voltage, ah, threshold voltage, very important. So that tells us when that, uh, what is the threshold by which this barrier comes down enough that the channel can turn on, or maybe here. So at what point have we applied enough gate bias that now all of a sudden the carriers can come piling across? And and since I tried to drill into you the um, the density of states, let me see. I can't see it from there. So then we have our sail, right, bounded by the density of states and bounded by the Fermi Dirac. And so this is the sail. And so as this comes up, this is where the carriers are in energy space. Um, and so as this barrier lowers, this is able to spill over the top. And so at what point do you hit the threshold voltage? Um, that's going to be determined by this. So we'll see later there's various exceptions which shift the offset, uh, but it's and it's possible to shift that, you'll see, uh, which we later called, so then you can move from depletion mode and so forth. Remember, remember uh, that we've now finally covered this. So now you start to see the method and the madness there. Um, so I think I can skip past some of this because this is a little less important. Here's another visual of that showing the band diagram and the uh, three, three D cutaway and the IV characteristics. But really, it's kind of redundant from what we've already covered. And yeah. So what happens is we make FET smaller, so then we start to get short channel effects, and so we do clearly wind into that uh, high field mobility where things are going to roll over, and we get uh, this, you know, uh, through the scattering, so we're going to get the saturation velocity, and when you have that, usually that can, can flatten out your gain, and so you can see how they're equally spaced. Uh, so, above threshold, uh, drift dominates, and a, a below threshold, diffusion dominates, or the drift to diffusion currents. And here you can see the saturation velocity. So, velocity overshoot in submicron MOSFETs, right, this is very, very common. 
So this is out of the IEDM. This is the conference that's going on in San Francisco that I just left to come here. Um, and so this is way back in 1992. And so imagine what we're, what's happening in today's 2018. I can't imagine uh, uh, what, what they're presenting this week. Um, and so as these carriers here, which is represented by this, uh, in this Monte Carlo simulation, you see them spilling over the barrier. And as they come across, they're coming up with kin such kinetic energy that they're mostly maintaining their energy, right? This is energy space, right? The Y is energy. So if they're, if they're and this is just uh, uh, distance. So as they're coming across, they're maintaining their energy. And the only way, uh, just to make sure this is crystal clear uh, from when we've looked at it before, the only way to move from here to here is what? When a carrier is, uh, these, most of these carriers are going this way, and the carriers down here are what? A different uh, level of energy. They have to, yes. to so lose the, their energy. They have to lose their energy. How do they lose their energy? Light or light? No, there's no light. This is just a fact. Mm -hmm. Recombination? No, not recombination. Scattering. Scattering. Right? So they scatter. So to go from here to here means they hit something, right? So they scatter. So that's why this Monte Carlo simulation is illustrating to you where the carriers are. And so the ones going across that don't lose their energy, they were not scattered. And so therefore, but they are being accelerated through the electric field for, uh, between the source and the drain. So here you can see there's nothing to inhibit their ability to continue to accelerate because you can see quite a large number of them are not being scattered. So they just continue to accelerate and accelerate and accelerate. And so therefore they exceed the speed limit, right? So this is the scattered ones bring those down. So they scatter. Very good. Um, so mess vets, uh, our importance, right? There's the ones. Oh yes, question. I don't get why in that case they don't, like they're not limited by the saturation velocity. Uh, anybody help me here? Oops. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, somehow I skipped over that one, but let's let's go to this. So there's the so the Felix Baumgartner analogy is that as you're coming through space from the capsule, from the Red Bull capsule, right? You, you, ex you exceed uh, Mach, what, what, what did we decide? It was uh, uh, from our due diligence, we found out it was what, what 1.2 Mach or something like that? Okay. Uh, so, uh, and so he, he exceeded the speed of sound until he re-entered this Earth's atmosphere because of the scattering or friction, what are you gonna call it, scattering? of the atmosphere, right? So here, this is, this is uh, calling, but causing it to roll over. But if I don't scatter, I'm gonna continue to accelerate, right? There's nothing to, because I still have the same electric f field, I'm gonna continue to accelerate and get faster and faster and faster, right? If I'm still stepping, if I'm still have a, a high electric field, I'm still uh, stepping on the gas, essentially, and the reason that I hit the saturation velocity is the acceleration taking place. Yeah, let me say it a little more clearly. When Felix Baumgartner is falling down, remember your physics. Gravity is pulling him down, accelerating him, and the friction of the atmosphere is a force vector that pushes him back up. And when those force vectors balance, he stops accelerating. Right? and the velocity becomes constant. So I submit to you that if you don't have a force like friction slowing you down, you continue to accelerate, so therefore you exceed the saturation velocity. So there was no scattering for a, a portion of these carriers, so therefore it ex exceeds the saturation velocity. Does that make a little more sense? I was just wondering like, why it doesn't scatter in that case. Is it because it's just like, it's so, like sub-micron? Yes, 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 yeah, this is a submicron, this is a short, uh, in submicron, yes, that's the, that's the caveat, yes, this is a short channel effect. So this is advanced CMOS devices. Yeah. 
So a mesvet is uh, is actually very important. The mesvets, uh, gallium arsenide based, they use, generally use higher band gap uh, material. You know, gallium arsenide has high mobility, electron mobility, uh, and the higher band gap leads to non-leaky shockies. Do you remember your shocky barrier uh, heights and so forth from the second first second midterm, second midterm. Um, and so, therefore, you can get a very good shocky barrier height. It's very non-leaky uh, for with the higher band gaps, right? It's harder to get a good shocky on a lower band gap like silicon or below that. And this makes a very high uh, power added efficiency for uh, for linear uh, amp amplification on mobile phones. And so, it's a very simple device. You basically have doped uh, gallium arsenide and a source drain ohmic contacts and a shocky in the middle. And uh, and so one of the problems, though, as you as you uh, we come back to this earlier story when we were talking about semiconductor materials, is as you scale the temperature, you end up with lattice scattering uh, and uh, impurity scattering. Lattice scattering was the basically phonons, right? The the, the lattice vibration, and so uh, the uh, mobility got lower and lower and lower as, it, as the system got hotter because it became more, uh, more phonons, more heat, right? And, uh, and the impurities were, as, it, as the system got slower, they, they were more sensitive to the ionized impurities and they, that led to scattering, right? So this shows, uh, the, and this is the reason why the MOFET works so well because I can, I can uh, divorce myself from this impurity scattering. But the MESFET it doesn't have that ability. We are limited by the impurity scattering and so and the phonon scattering. So therefore, the uh, mobilities that we get from the back of the textbook now are starting to be uh, compromised because um, we need to have for our transistor to carry a fair amount of current, we need a fair amount of charge in the channel. And to get a fair amount of charge, we need a fair amount of doping. And so we can have high mobility, but only with low doping. If I want to put more charge in the channel, then I dope it very highly, and the mobility goes down. So then this degrades the performance. So that's why modfets are where we can have our cake and eat it too. High mobility and large charge, right? So the impurity scattering is suppressed. And here you can see at the heterojunction discontinuity, in the conduction band, right? And we're not drawing the valence, they're not drawing the valence band down here. Well, this is the uh, al gas gas, so this is the aluminum. Uh, and we, uh, we modulation dope, so the doping occurs over here. So this is where the ionized impurity scattering takes place. But the carriers are over here, and so they're not where the ionized impurities are. So they don't have ionized impurity scattering when they modulation dope, meaning that they they're, they're, uh, they're falling into this well uh, by this transfer from their physical origin to here. Uh, because they're just going to look and try and find the global uh, extrema, right? And then I uh, tried to introduce to you the heart of a MOSFET is really a MOS capacitor where you slice through the, the, um, through the uh, MOSFET. And you come up with the band diagram associated with that. So you got the gate metal and the oxide and the semiconductor. And uh, then you have to look at the uh, work functions between the metal and the semiconductor. And the, the, in the semiconductor, it's drawn to the Fermi level. And so then we uh, see uh, the relationships, right? And so as we go through from this uh, unbiased uh, MOS, and we go into, we apply a, a small voltage, we torque the bands, so the voltage is less than zero, when, so meaning that it's negative, and so therefore, this has to go up with respect to the vacuum level, because by the negative voltage, I've, if I've applied the negative terminal of my battery to this side, I'm reducing the voltage with respect to the vacuum level. So this has to come up with respect to the other side. So this bends up, uh, torques up. The, the oxide, which has no charge, ideally, uh, has to bend. So you see the band tilting, not band bending, which is imply curvature. It's band tilting. 
because we're assuming right now this is a good ideal oxide, and it torques and pulls this up. We can then now have accumulation, we call this accumulation, because we can now have an accumulation of holes. We know this to be p-type from its unbiased case because of the position of the Fermi level. So therefore, um, this is becoming the Fermi levels, getting closer to the valence band, meaning uh, that if you read the tea leaves there, that tells me that it's becoming more uh, p-type at the surface of the semiconductor, right at that oxide interface, and so therefore this accumulates holes so by the very name. So, but that doesn't buy me anything in this particular situation because now all I have done is I have electrons here, electrons here, and all I did is, uh, is, is fill this up with holes. So I still have, I still am blocked. The electrons can't flow through this a hole rich zone. And so I, it hasn't bought me anything. But as I go the other direction, uh, apply a positive voltage to the gate, pushes the bands down with respect to the va va vacuum level, so therefore the bands start to bend down, the Fermi level starts to get closer to EI, and, and remember this is p-type, so therefore the surface has to be, by, the, by reading the tea leaves of where the Fermi level is with respect to valence band, conduction band, and EI, that means the surface of this material is becoming uh, more, more, uh, more n-type, and the only way that I can make p-type material more n-type, really, is to to push the holes away, right? Because I, uh, that's the first thing that's that's the first degree of freedom, as I like to phrase it. So this means that the p-type material becomes less p-type, and so the first thing that happens is it pushes the holes away and depletes them, so therefore I create that depletion region, right? But then eventually the depletion region uh, can't really respond as much by the torquing of the bands, and so then eventually the Fermi level bisects the uh, EI level, and Fermi level is, uh, rises above EI, and that means that the material has to be n-type. The surface has, of the semiconductor has to be n-type. It's no longer p-type. And the only way it can do that is by basically hoovering all of the minority uh, electrons to the surface and collecting them. So then it be, goes into an inversion, so the surface becomes n-type, even though it's, a, it's uh, ostensibly a p-type doped semiconductor. Um, so... Here we have the bands bending. Here we have a charge density distribution where we have a sheet charge on the gate and here we have the depletion region. And then that acts like a, a coaxial shielding uh, to house the inversion channel in between, which is where the signal's being carried. And so we have the electric field as a result and the electrostatics. So yeah, this is a little better representation from little z showing the, uh, the charge on the surf surface of the gate and the depletion region, and you take it a little bit farther into inversion, and then you have the additional spike of the charge in the channel. Um. Yeah, let me see. So then, we were talking about the, the capacitance. We have the capacitance due to the, uh, to the, let me go back here. Yeah. So then for capacitance voltage characteristics, very important. Uh, the MOS depends upon the voltage, uh, whether you're in accumulation, depletion, or inversion. So there's two types of capacitors we have to worry about. We have to worry about the MOS acts as a parallel plate capacitor dominated by the, uh, uh, the, the insulator. So this is the primitivity of the insulator and the thickness of the insulator, right? So that's one capacitance. The other capacitance is going to be the depletion region, which is the permittivity not of the insulator like this one. This is going to be the permittivity of the semiconductor because there's going to be a depletion capacitance 
uh, and that's going to be the permittivity of the semiconductor divided by uh, the width of the depletion region. And so then when you combine these two, when you, when you go into the voltage where you, you, ha you form depletion, then they uh, add as if it's two resistors in parallel. And so therefore, the uh, uh, capacitance decreases. So that's what we see here, is that the, um, until we start to form the, deple the depletion region, then, uh, then we have the one the, the uh, capacitance of the insulator, and then as we start to form the depletion region, they're adding uh, its, its uh, capacitors in series, add like resistors in parallel. So and then as I start to form my depletion region, it drops, 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 and then eventually I form the inversion channel, and at that point then it's going to cancel out, and then it's going to allow either a strong inversion, uh, I mean where you're able to come up, uh, or or stay flat. And now this is going to be a frequency dependency. So at this particular juncture, I have met my strong inversion condition. So I have all that charge in my channel. And if I'm operating at low frequency, um, then, uh, then the, the uh, charge in the inversion channel will respond within the frequency limitations. And this is better represented here. So at low frequency, the, the generation, because remember, where did those carriers come from in the channel? Silence. Oh, boy. Don't have silence on the exam. Is it from the source? No. These are electrons that came from where? Uh, those electrons here came from where? No, the yeah, metal's over here, uh, uh, hopefully uh, insulated by the gate dielectric. Quantum well? Yeah, it's in the quantum well, but where do they come from? Isn't this p-type material? Look at the formula, it's p-type material, right? And I have electrons there. Where do the electrons come from? Generation. Generation, bingo. Right. So it's generation recombination statistics, and remember, it's the uh, maybe maybe I lost you in my uh, in my colloqu in my uh, colloquialism, but you know I said that it hoovers up the 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 minority carriers, right? So it's 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 uh, it's it's collecting all the minority carriers that were created through generation, right? Remember the first equation I asked you to impart to memory: n i squared equals p times n. So if we have a p-type material, we have capital P sub P, and we have N sub P. These are the minority carrier electrons in a p-type matrix, right? That's why I had you impart that to memory, so that hopefully you wouldn't gaff on these kind of questions, okay? So uh, it hovers up the minority carriers um, uh, that were generate that were th are there from generation. So when we run this in low frequency, the carriers in the channel are being added to and subtracted to by recombination statistics. And that is a random thermal event. Slow, right, on the old microseconds kind of time frame. So as I, as I uh, uh, or, or, or less, so as I run this very, very low frequency, then the carriers in, the, in, the ch in that inversion channel can be added to or subtracted to quickly enough that it will hide the inversion channel's presence, right? Because this is an AC signal. This is an AC signal on top of a DC signal. And, um, and so this, this frequency um, uh, is so low that generation recombination statistics hide the presence of the inversion channel 
and the uh, ca relative capacitance comes back to a value consistent with what it was before the inversion channel and even the depletion region were created. So it's going to hide all that. Uh, whereas the higher frequencies, once you go beyond the, st uh, the response time of generation recombination, then the uh, inversion channel is, is, the, is represented in full glory electrostatically. And so therefore, the uh, capacitance stays low. So you can gain some insight as to the uh, statistics inside your channel based on that. So non-ideal MOSFETs, deviations from ideality, which is, of course, what we do struggle with every day. So work functions between the gate and the, um, uh, and the, and the semiconductor are not constant. They're often, semiconductor and metal are different. The modified work function uh, shifts with doping, so therefore phi ms is, is uh, going to be different uh, and can be very large and negative. Uh, and it's going to be dependent upon doping here. So here's the doping of the different materials uh, depending upon what you're using. So phi ms is going to be changing. Uh, here's the different work functions. Yeah, it's the same thing basically. Then, uh, based upon that phi ms discrepancy, I can actually have it so that I might actually induce a channel without applying a bias to the voltage. See here, the, the, if you read this uh, band diagram, I hope you guys can read band diagrams by now. In fact, maybe I might require you to draw some band diagrams on the final exam. Okay. And if you read this, the Fermi levels are aligned. Which tells me what? If the Fermi levels are aligned, tells me how much voltage is across this. No voltage. No voltage. Yes, no voltage because the Fermi levels are aligned, right? So the only way to torque it uh, is to apply a voltage. Otherwise, the Fermi level is like sea level, right? So it's it's like the, you know, the, the two sides of the Panama Canal lock have now equilibrated, right? And so therefore there's no, there's no, there's no pr uh, pressure, there's no voltage, that's, uh, and they've, they've equilibrated. And so in this particular case, to get to this what they call flat band condition, they've had to apply um, a, a vo an external voltage to be consistent with the work function difference to bring it into the flat band condition. So this is an external applied voltage called the flat band voltage to cancel out the internal discrepancies. Then we can have all this interface state charge. And it's one, it's a litany of things that can go wrong. I can have uh, alkali metals uh, racing through my, uh, my oxide. I can have such as sodium and potassium. You know, the sweaty hands of my, of my uh, 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 struggling students, you know, in the lab. They could, be, they could be perspirating and sweating onto their samples and causing voltage shifts, right? And um, I can have fixed charge, the SiO2 interface, because the interface is, uh, is going to have unsatisfied dangling bonds, so that's going to be another source, so that's going to be a fixed charge. It's going to be fixed at the interface because it's, that's where the SiO2 the silicon has the four bonds, and so some of them are incomplete, and that's why we use the 100 uh, because it's going to have the, the fewer number of dangling bonds per unit area. It's a lower planar density. We can have trapped charges, and now you've seen the lectures in, uh, uh, in, in the normal class time, how I can have imperfections in the SiO2. Remember, one of those sources was hot carrier effects. Carriers coming in so hot, that when they do scatter, remember, let's go back to the scattering thing in the ballistic transport. What if they come in so hot and they scatter up into the oxide, they can come in so hot they could break an SiO2 bond, creating a dangling bond and, and, and uh, uh, charge in the, in, in, the, uh, in the gate. So now we put it all together. This is an equation I want you to impart to memory for the final exam. Threshold voltage is dependent upon these four physical parameters. You better be able to rattle off the definitions of them all. Uh, we have the work function difference between the metal and the semiconductor. 
We have the uh, interface state charge, and we're lumping that all into one queue, but it's all those different four sources. And it's divided by the capacitance of the, um, uh, uh, with the uh, gate oxide. We have the depletion uh, charge, uh, and divided by the capacitance. And we have 2 phi f. What is 2 phi f? Work function of the Fermi level times 2. Uh, no, say it in a different way. Stefan. It's the condition for strong inversion. So what's another way of stating that? When the surface becomes as n-type in the in the channel as it is p-type in the bulk, right? And that's when we get the three cherries, you know, when the we pull down the, the the slot machine in Vegas, right? And then that's when the surface is now as n-type as the as the bulk is p-type. So now we have electrons in the channel, we have electrons in the source and drain, and we have electrons all throughout, and we win the jackpot. Right? So here's all that, uh, all the four sources. We have mobile charge, like the sodium potassium. We have oxide trap charge. We have oxide fixed charge. And we have interface trap charge. All of these things can go wrong, and they do go wrong. So here's, again, sort of a rendering of the oxide here. And, the, and this, so here you can see the, uh, the, well, the, the charge and the electric fields that are being uh, developed from that. Okay. Uh, so, as you can see, if I had mobile charge sloshing around in this oxide, moving back and forth, and had a field dependency, uh, and remember, this is just a, a mobile charge that is moving under the influence of an oxide. It doesn't move instantaneously. It sort of wiggles through the, the SiO2 dielectric and it'll sort of percolate through, and it takes a little while. So as I apply a, a ones and zeros to this transistor, it may slosh this way, and then I come back and I store, a, and, I, and I'm go, going from a one to a zero, or a zero to a one, and then it sloshes the other way, and so it's sloshing back and forth, creating this hysteresis. And so you can read the CV, because we know that this is when it's normal, and then as the depletion region starts to form, and so as we see this charge sloshing back and forth, that manifests this hysteresis, this gap. So you want, uh, for a good, well-behaved transistor, you really want no hysteresis. You don't want this to have the skew. You want it to, to, to when it comes skew, when you trace the, the waveform this way and ramp the voltage up while you're measuring the capacitance, and then you, measure, and then you ramp the voltage down, while, uh, and while measuring the capacitance, you want it to retrace itself. And then that's no, uh, uh, low hysteresis and indicative of very little of these, uh, these, these effects. Um, so. so then if you take and kind of pict pictorially show that uh, equation I wanted to you to impart to memory, you can see that some of these components, uh, this one's always negative, the interface charge is always negative, the depletion region is obviously positive or negative, depending on which channel you are. And the condition for strong inversion obviously depends whether you're uh, which uh, uh, channel you are, n-type or p-type. And uh, so then you can see those, the effects of the, of the... And so here you can see, as we have uh, interface charge, we can skew the, uh, the uh, high frequency and low frequency, so we get the skew. And by analysis of that, we can get some awareness as to how many interface states uh, we are having. So, uh, so here's the uh, a normal uh, gate, and we can get tunneling into the gate or from the gate by uh, by the uh, Fowler-Nordheim tunneling. And as the gate gets thinner and thinner. Uh, this becomes a, a factor here, and then we can even have direct tunneling at some point, where it's tunneling right through the, the uh, rectangular portion. So through the triangular portion, we call it Fowler-Nordheim. And so here we can see the current 
through through the gate uh, as a function of of uh, reciprocal electric field. And so then we can have uh, we might have charging various locations, holes and electrons here. This is showing trapped holes and electrons in the oxide can distort the band and increase the electric field uh, in various places. So this might allow more tunneling in by that. So it actually one effect, one deleterious effect causes another deleterious effect. So then the key equations come down to the uh, essentially this circles all the way back. This is kind of the long form, but it really circles all the way back. What page are we on? We're on page. Uh, does it show the page number? Oh, 94, okay. So this shows, so really we're coming back to this uh, model here where it's the uh, mobility, the, uh, uh, the capacitance, the uh, width of the channel versus the width is the length uh, in this direction. And then the LG is the, is the distance the, 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 the carriers are moving from the source to the drain. And then we have this VDD, the power supply minus the threshold voltage squared. So it really always comes back to this equation. Um, what did I say, 94? Uh, not there, 94. So then we have the, uh, the conductance, uh, the differential conductance of, of the channel here, it, or GM, is really the delta IDS over delta VDS. And so you can see that related to the uh, channel width and channel length and the mobility and the, and the gate, uh, capacitance. So uh, as VD uh, increases, as the, as the vol voltage increases, the voltage across the oxide decreases and the mobile charge reduces or the, and so channel can become pinched off at the drain and uh, the, the FET reaches saturation and at that particular point this is basically the equation I just flashed from the ITRS roadmap is essentially this one half mobility CI and so forth so really uh, the pictogram is really a very nice representation so then the mutual transconductance is GM is really the uh, IDS in saturation over the VGS. And so that's related to the, uh, um, uh, the dimensional parameters of the gate, width and length, and the average mobility, and the oxide, and, and the voltage. Okay. So again, kind of coming back, now we know that there's a depletion region that forms. And now you can see how the depletion region contour is protecting the formation of the channel acting like a coaxial cable, if you will. And uh, so here, the idealized. And then, of course, we can uh, we can go p-type and n-type. Right, this is going to be the n-type n plus wells, uh, you know, source drains. And here's p plus uh, source drains. So this is the p-mos version. And then we can move the threshold voltage around. Um, how can we move the threshold voltage around? I know I haven't gotten to that in the review, but does anybody remember? Okay. This is testable too, so do pay attention. So here's the uh, uh, transconductance or GM. Call, also called a transconductance, so you can see how it's got a sweet spot often where it's, uh, where it's the maximum gain. And at some point then the, uh, below threshold voltage, the gain is obviously disappears because you lose the channel. And at some point uh, the gate voltage is too high and you also lose. Um, and so. so here's the P and the N. Why are these asymmetric? I asked this in class. Does anybody remember the answer? Holes have lower mobility. Holes have lower mobility. Uh, the effective mass is higher, and, the, and, the, and their mobility is lower as a result. Uh, you, one could argue. 
and so therefore the uh, PMOS is therefore an underperformer compared to the NMOS. Because if you go back to that equation down here, uh, the saturation current is related, and the, here's the mobility, right? So the mobility is exactly as was just said. So the mobility of the holes is lower than the electrons. So therefore, the, uh, they look kind of asymmetric to each other. And so how would, I, how would I make these equal to each other? Balance this out if I'm a circuit designer, and I want to make a, 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 an inverter, so I want to have a P channel transistor that's of the same current magnitude as the NMOS transistor. Size of the PMOS wider. Yes, right? Again, go back to that equation, and all I'm gonna do is, is increase my Z, the gate width, right? So I'm just gonna, so the whole, so the PMOS transistors often have to be longer, you know, wider, really, is the terminology. Um, so they have to have a, a, a wider gate, uh, gate width uh, to, to uh, overcome the fact that the uh, mobility is lower. So the, the Z goes higher for the uh, mobility going lower, and so then they balance each other out. So. Um, now we start to put things together. Uh, we have the the N plus, and we have this gate, and here we can see the field oxide that is going to, to uh, 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 separate electrically this transistor from the transistor that's sort of over here. And this, is create, this could potentially create a parasitic transistor, right? Because this drain and this, 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 this source and this drain could act like the source drain of another FET, right? And this uh, interconnect metal going from one transistor to the other could be influencing this oxide, creating an inversion channel here. And if the voltage was high enough across this interconnect uh, metal, then I could actually uh, connect this source and this drain to each other through the inversion channel, right? There's really no, I mean, if I apply enough voltage to this gate interconnect, interconnect I can have that. But because this field oxide is so thick, then the voltage needed to do that should exceed the, the voltages that are uh, going across that uh, metal interconnect, right? So it might take 10, 20 volts, which is way beyond my power supply. So I'll probably never uh, create that inversion channel and never activate that. So how do you uh, engineer the threshold voltage and get uh, normally on, normally off transistors? So one is going back to this equation. I've got phi ms, I can, I can engineer that. I can engineer the, uh, the interface state charge density, hopefully. I can change my depletion capacitance, uh, depletion charge uh, by the doping, and I can change the conditions of strong inversion by the doping. So some things can happen by the way I manufacture it. So I can change from a silicon gate, and that's gonna temper my phi ms. I can change my CI, my, my uh, insulator capacitance, by ch re reducing the thickness, and so that should um, uh, reduce everything. I can raise the permittivity of the insulator, and I can do ion implantation C. I can implant impurities uh, that can maybe counteract the trap charge. So if I have trap charge, um, I can apply a substrate bias or body body effect here, which can uh, change the uh, the um, yeah this one. So remember this depletion region that sort of contours the source drain, and uh, actually showed maybe a little more uh, magnified here. So here's that depletion. So if I apply a voltage to the back of the, trans of the substrate, I can increase or decrease this depletion region. And so that will influence electrostatically what happens in the channel. So therefore, um, the uh, substrate bias can, yeah, substrate bias here 
can modulate. That's, a, that's another way. I would say less desirable, as I said, you're kind of adding energy to the system. So MOSFET finer points, you can get into the self-aligned high frequency. They're kind of one and the same. And that's showing here. So I could, one, I could tailor my, uh, my, uh, my threshold voltage by implanting right at that interface to cancel out the interface charge. But I could also make it self-aligned by implanting through the polysilicon gate and making the source drains exactly line up to the edge of the gate. So now everything's well defined. I don't have the overlap capacitance that would slow things down. So if I want to uh, buy a microprocessor with 3.7 gigahertz uh, operating speed, um, then this is going to slow things down. But if I implant boron through the gate, then I'm going to have these extensions which will exactly uh, index the uh, source and the drain to each other. Uh, here you can see this did a, 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 maybe a tube uh, a diffusion in one of the tube furnaces. Or so this is did a, the old school uh, diffusion through this polysilicon gate. Similar effect as the implantation. So here's what the threshold voltage adjust by the substrate bias, right? So you can move this around. But remember, the substrate bias is going to move all the transistors on the chip. And uh, that's why it's preferred to do something like an ion implantation where through the lithography and, and masking, I can only, I can change just some of the transistors as the circuit designer uh, dropped and dragged them uh, onto the chip uh, layout. So then we end up with our equivalent circuit model. So we have, it's a, it's a, a voltage controlled uh, current source, right? So it's dependent upon GM, the transconductance and the gate bias. And then we have all these parasitics. We have resistances, we have capacitances, capacitances of the gate to the source, capacitances of the gate to the drain. We have all these different uh, resistances from the, uh, the source, resistances of the ohmic contacts, right? So we have all these different uh, parasitics. But the heart of it is a uh, voltage-dependent current source, right? So further scaling the high K solution, uh, why do we want to go to high K? Well, we can minimize the tunneling through the uh, tunneling through the very, very thin gate oxide. And so as it gets down to 1.2 nanometers, then really it just becomes a leaky quantum mechanical sieve. And so the only way we can mitigate that is we need it to electrically uh, I don't know. Let me do. Uh, let me do. Uh, uh, what page is this? This is nine one on thirty. Okay. So I need this capacitance to continue to go higher and higher. And so I'm trying to make the oxide thinner and thinner, but one way, but at some point, it becomes too thin, right? So if I, um, this, this is embedded in the C-ox. So if I make this thicker again, to, uh, basically the, what's important here is the quotient. The quotient of this continues to get, need to get higher and higher and higher. So if I go from SiO2 permittivity, then, and this is 1.2 uh, nanometers, was it 1.2 or 1.8? I think it was 1.2 from memory, 1.2 nanometers, then SiO2, then if I double the permittivity here, then I can double the thickness and electrically, for the, electric, the electrical equivalent uh, properties uh, is that they're the same. So if I can make the permittivity five times larger, like hafnium oxide or something, then I can still double the oxide thickness and still get a two and a half, half times performance, right? So if this is five times larger and this is two times larger, then my five is divided by two and I get a two and a half times improvement. So I'm improving my transistor by two and a half times, uh, but I've doubled effectively doubled my uh, uh, dielectric thickness, right? Where did I say, 130? 
some more about there. 130. Oh. So I've I've uh, 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 doubled. Uh, so as it gets smaller and smaller, it becomes untenable. But I can basically double. Oops. I can double my uh, permittivity. And I get double the performance. But here, this is the same, right? I've doubled my permittivity, but I've also doubled my uh, thickness. So then the two in the numerator and the two in, two in the denominator cancel each other out. And from an electrical point of view. This is equivalent electrically to this. But this is a much more robust device because I have less quantum mechanical tunneling through that dielectric. Right. So that was the innovation. And, uh, but because I am depositing the high K dielectric onto the, uh, onto the silicon, my interface state density here is, is now a problem. So now I have to worry about how to tame that. So I have to have very good processing conditions. Uh, so when I throw the uh, silicon dioxide out, it's like throwing the baby out with the bath water. So I've, I've, yes, I've improved my dielectric constant, but I've also created all this collateral damage of interface state density that I was just belaboring about. So MOSFET scaling. Um, you can get into the hot electron effect, as we saw, saw from the uh, barrier model. And so as the electron gains kinetic energy, it walks up the EK diagram, getting higher and higher energy. And eventually, it can actually surmount the SiO2 interface and inject right in. And <coughs> that's why I want to tailor my electric field with a lightly doped drain. And so... And we can also have drain-induced barrier lower, lowering by the electrostatics. Um, and so you can make the source drain junctions very shallow. Uh, so, so, yeah, that's one point I want to make sure is clear. That, yeah, this is just not showing the whole thing. But recognize in the scaling that as I'm making the transistor narrower in the lateral direction, I also have to make it narrower in the z-dimension in the transistor, right? And so that's what that was talking about, is it becomes harder and harder. Where'd it go? Yeah, it makes harder and harder to make very shallow source drain uh, down into the transistor. So you want those to be extremely shallow. Um, and the channel doping needs to be higher and higher, so that's controlled by the drain from controlling the source. And... Uh, so here's all the things that can go wrong. Thin oxide breakdown. You can have charge coming over this barrier and implanting into the oxide, causing oxide charging. They can come down and, and implant into the uh, substrate, creating substrate current. They can even uh, come in so hot and heavy that, they, that they're creating electron hole pairs. Basically, what is that called? From one of the earlier exams. Avalanche. Avalanche multiplication, so then all of a sudden I've got the, the uh, damage from that. That's going to raise the current. Yes. So you can see how it shifts with stress as you're applying uh, more. And there's the subshift. So here's the, uh, here's the drain-induced barrier lowering. So that barrier gets lowered as the, the, as the uh, drain gets tighter and tighter. The electrostatics of the drain influence the source, and therefore the barrier gets lowered. And that's called drain-induced barrier lowering. And so then this carriers, this, the carriers in the, uh, the sail that are in the source can now splatter over the, the uh, barrier much more easily. So I'm hoping that by, by emphasizing the barrier model, that it's, uh, you can see how it's easier to wrap your head around some of the advanced uh, C, uh, CMOS uh, issues. These are a little bit lesser important. There's, we're starting to get a little more uh, running out of time in some of the lectures. We're talking about sh uh, charge sharing and so forth. I'll be honest, this is maybe a little less important than some of the other parameters I've been talking about. Um, and uh, uh, let me see, sort of this additional depletion charge. This is a secondary effect. And I'm going to hit you with the primary effects for the exam. 
Uh, here, you, yeah, you know, this is this is kind of a secondary effect uh, where you get the Zener tunneling and the and the charge. Uh, so bigger picture, as you're scaling, things are getting smaller and smaller on your layout, your cadence. Um, and so you can see the devices. Here's your inverter. This is why your uh, PMOS and your NMOS need to be balanced with each other so that the currents match, right? So current coming in has to equal current coming out, so therefore these have to be the same current carrying cap capability. And so the N PMOS might need to be larger. So they have to be balanced. And then you can see now I start to port that into the integrated circuit. And here you can see the uh, the uh, uh, the gates and so forth, how they're starting to become mushrooms and the devices. Yeah, so making all the interconnects. Uh, yeah, and then this one I like, you can see how the, the transistors become sort of secondary almost than all the complexity of the metals. Um, so that's pretty much as you get into some of this, these are some of the applications of them, but not so much about the, the usage. And I'll be talking about this in tomorrow's lecture about the, uh, the, the future of MOSFETs, you know, fin fats and gate all around and tunnel fats and so forth. Uh, actually, they were announcing the award winner for the best paper award. And it was a team that I know uh, 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 from IMEC actually won the uh, best paper award. And uh, we have two journals, the elect uh, IEEE Electron Device Letters, which is a short th uh, three, four pages, and then there's the Transactions on Electron Devices, which is longer. And the team from IMEC won with this gate all around topology. And then there's also Tunnel Fets, and I'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, but any, oh, so that's pretty much it. And so remember, I'm gonna talk, finish up and clean up this tomorrow and I'll talk about bipolar. So I'll let me open up to questions and you can go all the way back to September. <coughs> Anything on your mind? Yes. Um, a lot of the stuff that we've been doing has been building on um, things that we learned earlier in the semester. What would you say is like the percentage of new material versus strictly old material? Okay, for uh, purposes of the YouTubers out there listening to this, let me repeat his question. So the question was, uh, how much is the percentage of a new material be on the final exam versus the old material? I will be honest, it will be weighted towards the, uh, the newer material. Um, because that you've not been tested on that yet. But, uh, and the older material I have tested you on. But if you remember, um, my, when I assign letter grades, I want to kind of dovetail something else and get this on the record. When I assign final letter grades, I mentioned to you long before, and I want to repeat it now, going into the final, that I have a, quite a level of forgiveness for your grades. So um, uh, some of the material will be repeated, and I might be sort of a, a 20, 20, 60, or, or 25, 25, 50 sort of skewed towards the newer material. Okay. Um, but I will go back to some of the old material as a chance, uh, give you an opportunity to sort of revisit that. And so if you can bang the final exam out of the park, you know, really hit a home run. Uh, and, and so if, you, if I see that in the second midterm and the final exam, you've really mastered this and you've started to really understand how I'm trying to ask questions, you know, I'm really trying to uh, drill upon the foundational, the fundamental questions, rather than waste your time with all these esoteric e equations and plug and chug and so forth. I don't think you learn as much fundamentally from that. You can look that up and do that in your homeworks, but I think fundamentally, what are you going? What I want you to remember a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now, is some of these things, and if you can understand. Fermi Dirac statistics, you're gonna you're gonna see the relationship tomorrow of how this is the genesis of the tunnel fit, for instance. And so um, so I do remember that if you have done really poorly on your first midterm and then do much, much better on your second midterm and final exam, 
I have the liberty to raise you an entire letter grade when I find your, your final letter grades, when I take the mathematics of where you are, you know, you're, you're 20, 22nd uh, in, the, in a class of 34 or something like that, but I look at where you, where you started and where you finished, and I can see this huge meteoric trajectory and I can raise you, but it also works the other way that if you did really well in the first midterm and uh, really well in the second midterm and you phone in your, mid your final exam, uh, I, will, I will dock you and I will start to come in and I'll start to question how did you get that first uh, midterm and, and second midterm? Maybe you sat next to someone uh, and, and, and so forth. And how, why, how could you fumble on the final? Um, uh, so badly when you and and time should not be an element. I will probably have a somewhat shorter, briefer questions um, on the final, and I sh usually the exam is is of a similar length uh, to the midterms, and so therefore, since you have essentially doubled the time um, and a similar amount of questions. There really should be no one, when the time runs out, I really hope that there's hardly anyone left in the room. And so therefore, time should not be an element. So there's no reason why you should gaff on the final exam. And so that's why you can be docked if you, if you really plummet and really, really calls into question how, how you did really well on the first two midterms and tank so badly on the final. So don't phone it in. Please kind of finish strong. Everyone finish strong strongly and uh, so question so uh, it's long-winded answer but uh, it'll be wa definitely weighted towards the f uh, final material questions okay. Should we call it quits go home for dinner I'm so confused oh. about the misfit and MOSFET. They are, they are the same they are the same things actually yes uh, Even. Uh, yeah, I mean, I published a paper back in my graduate days where, where I deposited aluminum onto a material, and then we did a, an experiment where we converted aluminum into aluminum oxide, and then that became our gate dielectric. And so then that was, um, that was an insul you know, that was an oxide, it was an insulator, but in our public paper we published, we call it a misfit, because it wasn't the you know the silicon dioxide being ox. You know the silicon is 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 oxidized, but through the gate, through the dry oxidation, kind of turning into a gate oxide. So, so it's it's just the nomenclature. Um, that are you creating the oxide by an oxidation of the ch of the channel material, or are you uh, getting an oxide or an insulator by a deposition process? It's it's semantics, and I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna try and uh, trick you with semantics on a final exam. It's gonna be remember it's gonna be foundational questions. Thank you. I uh, appreciate your coming. I know that uh, sometimes since it's uh, hopefully recorded and, and will hopefully be uploaded, sometimes that uh, means maybe you don't need to come, but uh, I think it gives a chance to ask questions and challenge me in person and so forth. And it's one thing to listen on YouTube versus kind of being live, so, uh, so hopefully uh, this is helpful for you. Okay. See you tomorrow. And... Uh, Best wishes, everyone.